Hello there, friends. Welcome to another episode of Brown Bags and Bibles. I'm Scott Wakefield, lead pastor at First Christian Church of Greenville, Green County, Tennessee. Joined, as always, by... Mark Liebert. I'm one of the elders here at First Christian Church. Yep, yep. We are starting a new series today. Yes. About the Word of God. Excited about this. Yes, I am too. Some good old-fashioned classical theological categories and... Um, stuff that will be helpful for people. We're asking the question, what are the different forms of the Word of God? Mm-hmm. Uh, what do we mean by the phrase, the Word of God? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's something we say a lot. Yeah. Um, I use it all the time yeah. <laughs> in preaching from an on stage and it, from on stage. And uh, there are times when I think I, I'd better make sure I'm clarifying, written, uh, enfleshed in Jesus, mm-hmm. um, the truth of God that is a word, a mm-hmm. message, um, because they're different meanings there yeah um, so it's going to be helpful i think for people to, to help differentiate for their own scripture reading and, and thinking yeah. about the world yeah and i think coming out of our series we just completed on the book by carl truman we mentioned at the end of our last episode that uh, to be a people of the book a people who are grounded in written doctrine mm-hmm. and instruction mm-hmm. is a critical element of how we navigate this new mindset where people just think truth is how I feel and sense things intuitively. Mm -hmm. Like actually as a Christian, no, that's not how we determine truth. So this is a good series coming out of that. Yeah, there's an authority for this stuff. Yeah, And we are taking our cues mostly from Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology. Um, So we'll have a lot of this that that lines up with that. Some of it will not. Mm -hmm. In fact, what we'll start off with does not. Yeah. Two categories of general and special revelation. And uh, we're talking here um, about how God reveals himself uh, in, in large scale terms in two different categories. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to look this up, you can get a lot of this right from gotquestions.org. Just type in general and special revelation. Um, but general revelation are general truths that can be known about God. (laughs) Oh, general. (laughs) (laughs) Through natural means. Yes. Things available to every human being. Yes, all humans throughout all time. Yes, general revelation is general truths. Yeah. Known through natural means. Right. And uh, so that would be, for example, nature. Yes, (laughs) natural. (laughs) General truths through nature. Psalm 19 is one of the most important and famous texts for this. Yeah. Um, Psalm 19, one to six, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech. There are no words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. This may be not quite obvious at first, as we've re- read those first couple of few verses there. Um, but I think it's worth putting a fine point on that those first few verses, um, I'll, I'll reread them after I say this, I think it's, it'll be helpful. They make a point that extends beyond just mere intellectual awareness of one's like smallness in relation to nature mm-hmm. and creation, mm-hmm. right? This is not just nature talks about, um, about something out there. Mm-hmm. Um, it does. And um, this isn't just a, a point about our smallness in relation to creation, but it's actually about the categorical differences between creator and creation. That's right. And I, and I think that is what people have to get here with this general revelation thing, especially yeah. with nature. And then as we'll talk about with conscience as well, because there's, there is, as we look at creation, an inner moral awareness of God throughout the whole world that extends beyond intellectual and goes into this moral thing that we'll talk about here Mm -hmm. because of that creator creature distinction. Mm -hmm. So when we say the heavens declare the glory of God, like this isn't just poetic, nice language. We're saying nature declares the glory of a specific being named God. That's right. And Paul, we'll get to that yeah. in a minute, but Paul... Yeah, I'm jumping ahead in a sense, yes. Yeah, he references that. Yeah, it's not just the heavens declare there's a God. Right. It says the heavens declare the glory of God. Of the one true almighty God. Right. Right, capital G. So day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. 
mm-hmm. of God, mm-hmm. not salvifically. Mm-hmm. We'll get to that soon. Uh, there is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard by all people. Right. In other words, what it's saying is everyone has access to That's this. That's exactly right. That's a huge point, I think, worth making here with, with general revelation, especially. Yeah. Okay. Their voice goes out throughout all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them, he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. Yeah, he... It, the, the psalmist takes the heavens in general and focuses and says, for example, the sun, the sun by itself That's right. speaks to the glory of God. Yeah, it picks out the sun as one of the yeah. many that it could have been talking about. I often think of this verse when I get up in the morning. You know, now we're recording this in wintertime, and I'm up before the sun rises. Mm-hmm. And to see the sunrise, mm-hmm. I often think to myself, the heavens declare the glory of God. Mm-hmm. And at night, it's obviously it gets dark earlier now. Sure. And I see the stars more and the yes. moon. I, I'm, I'm telling you, multiple times a week, this phrase runs through my head. Mm-hmm. The heavens declare the glory of God. Yes. The day and the night. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. Acts 14, 17. Yet he did not leave himself without witness. God. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your heart with food and gladness. Yeah, here's an argument made about God providing rains and fruitful seasons. In other words, the common grace of God that provides you with what you need is actually a witness to the character and nature of God himself. Yes, and and Paul and Barnabas there in that setting were making the argument for the one true God based on that common grace and experience. He says, we are also men of like nature with you. Mm -hmm. Um, And then he says there in verse 17, yet he did not leave himself without witness. Yeah, which which means that as people in general in our world prosper, right? they do so by the grace of God. That's right. And it is meant to draw them to God. And yet we presume on him Mm -hmm. and we think we have prospered because of our own abilities. Mm -hmm. There's no God. Mm -hmm. It is I who does everything. Yeah, that's not that's not acknowledging the creator creature distinction. Yeah, yeah. And then a famous passage here, um, Romans one, eighteen through twenty one. Yes, yeah, this is what I was referencing earlier. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, where God in His fullness and presence are. Um, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. You can't suppress what you don't possess. That's right. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God, or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. It's fascinating. I I was reading it again just in my Bible time this morning before I came in to work. The the main problem that we have as humans is not intellectual, it is moral. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. We know enough about God, Mm -hmm. but we suppress the truth because it impinges on our personal freedom and desire to live autonomous lives as mm-hmm. we would autonomous me meaning our own law I'll be my own god yeah. Yeah. yeah for notice it says although they knew god yes they did not honor him as god or give thanks to him and so the argument paul's making is that there's no one who can say innocently i didn't know there was one true god he says that's right you can see his eternal power and his divine nature clearly but the issue is why, why are they without excuse? The issue is that they morally suppress it mm-hmm. because if I'm answerable to, as you often say on Sunday morning, an all-knowing and all-powerful and all-present God, mm-hmm. if I'm answerable, mm-hmm. well, that has, that has ramifications for the choices I make. That's right. And, and morally, that makes me uncomfortable. Yes. That's the, the Radical issue. implications that people know and sense and yet suppress yeah yeah um i think 
this may be a little early to say it. Well, let me, let me save that. But I do have another thought. Um, just parenthetically for the record, um, we are reformed, Calvinistic, soteriologically, um, believing that, for example, God is the empowering force that makes regeneration happen and then faith happens because the, yeah. the, the inner work of the spirit through the heart. In other words, he opens our eyes first right, and we then respond in faith. Yes, undoing the suppression of the truth. Um, or as Paul says, removing the veil that covers their eyes or the yeah. God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. There's mm-hmm. all sorts of scriptures yes. about that. Which is another example of this yeah. right there. Um, just want to say parenthetically though, that classic... Arminians um, still believe exactly yep. what we're saying here yep. about um, all humanity being like general revelation isn't enough to save, but it's definitely right. enough to condemn. Yeah, there yeah. you go. And all humanity is there. Yeah, until some are not. Yeah, right. So even classic Arminians agree with everything we've been saying so far. So we've talked about general revelation in terms of nature, and then we've talked about this implied it a couple times conscience. Yeah, but Paul then makes that argument clear in the next chapter of Romans. Yeah. Romans chapter 2, verse 15. When he's talking about this distinction between Jew and Gentile, Jew being the ones who have the, the special revelation of God's law, mm-hmm. and the Gentile meaning everyone else who did not have the the special written words of God. Right. So, well, then maybe there they have excuse then because they don't have access to God's law. Is that right? And then Paul deals with that. Yes, and he deals with it by saying, well, they had the law in this sense, um, the moral law written on the hearts of all humanity for all time, their conscience, written on their conscience. So he says in Romans uh, 2.15, they show um, that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. Yeah. He makes the point, it doesn't matter whether you are Jew or Gentile, whether you have access to God's specific revelatory law or not, everyone has access to knowledge about God that they do not live up to or respond to appropriately. Yes. People will claim otherwise. Yeah. um, Until they're blue in the face. But Scripture says they have deceived themselves. In yeah. this sense, yeah. um, there's a great little note here in the ESV study Bible notes um, on two fourteen to sixteen. It says the very existence of this testimony, referring to the law written on their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, their conflicting thoughts, referring to that as this testimony. The very existence of this testimony is sufficient to render people accountable to God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. So when you hear people who would deny God, who would claim there is no God, and yet they have a conscience about what's right and wrong, yeah, it is yet a further indication that there is an awareness of ultimate sense of right and wrong and truth that comes from God himself. Yeah, and uh, I like to test it by just punching people in the face <laughs> at random and seeing if they really are uh, without a moral code inside. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Anytime someone says that's not fair, so. that's not just, right. that's not right. That's right. It is a reference to this moral law in the heart. C.S. Lewis talked a lot about yes. this. Like, where does it come from? That's, that's absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. By the way, and we don't have time to get into it in this discussion, but this is also why the argument that says, what about the innocent pagan who's never heard? That's right. The innocent heathen in another country who's never heard about Jesus. And the answer to that is there is no innocent anyone. Right. There is no innocent anyone because we all reject the knowledge we receive Mm -hmm. yep that's where you must start and once you begin with all of us deserve god's wrath then it changes the discussion entirely it does and it's no longer about well i deserve or they deserve well you want to talk about deserve right it's the opposite it's we deserve god's wrath yeah so the two categories that we're highlighting now are general revelation which is a general uh, knowledge about God, general truths that can be known about God through natural means. Mm-hmm. Sometimes people call that natural revelation. Yeah. Um, but that often will define it too much as being about nature. Okay, yeah. Without the conscience right. part. That the we heart of about. man, the conscience, yeah. That's right. So we'd like to stick with general there. And then there's special revelation. Yeah, which so are special specific, revelation? Special. <laughs> um, more specific truths that are known about God through supernatural 
means. Ah, supernatural. Yes, not okay. just natural. Right. So, of course, you're thinking of the Word of God, and that's true, but there's more than just that. Yes. And we see all of this in Scripture. So, Scripture tells us all the ways in which God reveals himself supernaturally. Yes, it does. So, again, we're using Scripture to define this, and that will become important as we go through this series. Scripture is our guide and our authority. Preach. All right. So, uh, physical appearances of God, dreams, visions, scripture, and Jesus. Those are the five different types of special revelation here. Okay. The first is physical appearances of God. Genesis 3, 8. This is Adam and Eve. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. This is right after they sinned, so they felt shame, Mm -hmm. which, of course, is the immediate effect of sin, which is guilt before God. But interesting, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking. Now, God doesn't have feet. No. But in some way, he manifested himself physically. Apparently, there was some rustling of leaves. So that they heard it and knew exactly what it was. Yes, and they had heard it before. Right. Because the implication here... um, in the Hebrew is they've been walking in the garden in the cool mm-hmm. of the day, enjoying their time with God yeah. like that before. And he said, where are you? Meaning it was expected they would meet together. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So physical appearances of God would not be normal. No. We're calling these supernatural. And I wouldn't expect you to experience it today necessarily. We don't see many of these. No. But nonetheless, here's scripture. an example of it in scripture. Right. Yeah. All right. Um, dreams. Mm. Much more common in Scripture. Much more common. Genesis twenty-eight twelve. This is Jacob. So we'll give an example from the Old Testament and then the New Testament. He dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and on top of it, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Yeah, Jacob's ladder. But a very, very well-known passage where he had a, a dream mm-hmm. when God spoke to him. That's right. So that's yes. Genesis 28. There was apparently um, some sort of to and fro uh, portal is, a, is too much of a sci-fi word, but uh, it, kind of that sense yes. of um, the opening up of the presence of God in heaven yeah. through that dream with the ladder there. Yeah. Right. And it's just a dream that he had. Right. Matthew 1, 20. So here's the New Testament. But as he, Joseph, as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Right. So uh, inarguably, a, a dream in which the Lord appeared and spoke mm-hmm. and recorded for us. And we all know that as we just finished the Christmas season. Yes. Yeah. So dreams. Sometimes God has spoken through dreams. Physical appearances of God, dreams, visions. Yeah, a little slightly different category than dreams. Obviously fairly similar, but a different term. And we see this in Scripture as well. Again, both Old and New Testaments. Yes, and and Scripture will talk about dreams and visions. Yeah. uh, And and differentiate. Yeah. Um, And yet sometimes um, there are are passages where you're thinking, okay, this might have been a dream. Yeah. Was this a vision where he... This happened while being awake. Right. Are they awake or not awake? I'm not not sure. And that's the basic distinction, I think, uh, for the most part. Visions, Genesis 15, 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram, still at this point, Abram, in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Okay. Old Testament. Yep. Acts 10, 3, about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. Famous passage on Cornelius, who was a Gentile, and how God orchestrated to get Cornelius and Peter together, Mm -hmm. that the gospel was for the entire world, including the Gentiles. But here, to do so, a vision comes to Peter and to Cornelius separately, where God brings them together. Yes. A vision. Which is indicative in Acts that the Holy Spirit's doing this work. That's right. Yes. And so the visions and these dreams are true and right and good and helpful as they come alone from God. Right. Right. That's right. <laughs> and that that's an that's an important piece of the the word being transmitted uh, doesn't just come from me, you, right. psychedelics. Right. And we'll we'll get <laughs> yes. psychedelics. Just thought I'd throw that in. We'll get into some caution about dreams and visions. Yeah. I think the one thing to say right now is there would never be a vision or a dream from God that ever contradicts his written word. That's right. You don't see that in Scripture. No. In fact, you see the opposite. You see warnings that it is a false vision or a false dream mm-hmm. if it is not in line with God's written, revealed word. That's right. Mm-hmm. But we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. Yep. 
So we've talked about physical appearances of God, dreams, visions, and then our fourth of five special revelation categories here is scripture itself. Right. Second Timothy three sixteen and 17, famous passage, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. It's a real cool term, right? Breathed out by God. Theopneustos. You may be familiar with inspired. Yes. Uh, but it refers to breath. Yes. The breath it, of God himself. Yes. Breathing out. Yes. Yeah, so that's why it's translated that way. Breathed out by God. A really yes. cool idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then finally, Jesus. Yeah. Jesus himself, himself. is the special revelation from God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hebrews 1, 1 to 3. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Still talking about Jesus there. Mm-hmm. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. You know, those three verses alone, you could preach for a month on those, Scott. I, I love that if you think about it, everything was created by Jesus. Mm-hmm. But it's not just created by Jesus. It's upheld. Yes, by it's Jesus. sustained by him. <laughs> yeah. But notice he says, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. So there's the written word of God. That's how God spoke to us. Mm-hmm. And then in these last days, he's spoken to us by, by his, his son. son. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. By his son being instrumental dative means, if I'm remembering correctly. Okay, good. You're of Greek. The ner- of the nerdy. You're Koine Greek. Yeah, I think. Oh, um, and also it says, whom he appointed the heir of all things. So if you think about it, God, is, Christ is both the origin of all things yes he upholds all things currently and he is where all things are going in other words he's the beginning the middle and the end Mm -hmm. it's all about jesus Mm -hmm. yeah cool really cool stuff yes word of caution yeah although god has spoken through dreams we should exercise great discernment yeah we put this in because well there's still a lot of interest in god speaking through dreams today yeah And you will hear about this particularly in other cultures where perhaps, and importantly, the word of God is not as accessible. Yes. But here in America. By which you meant the written. I meant the written word of God. God. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. And we, here where we have multiple versions on our phone, I would think it would be incredibly rare for God to speak through dreams and visions. We're not saying that he cannot. But there is danger, and this, this is important. What is the danger here? What is the danger? We want to walk through that. Well, we've got a few dangers. Yes. Uh, visions and divinations and revelations can be faked. And we even see that in Scripture. Yeah, it can be from Satan, not from God. That's right. It can be used for evil instead of good. Yes. So we want to show you from Scripture why this is true and why, therefore, we must exercise great caution in saying God revealed himself to me in a dream or I had a vision, Yes. or sometimes say, people say God spoke to me. Okay, if you're referring to the written word of God and how he speaks to you through his word mm-hmm. or how his Holy Spirit impresses on your conscience something that is in line with Scripture, that's mm-hmm. one thing. Mm-hmm. But outside of that, be very, very careful. Um, especially when you are the main soul interpreter of any of those things that you've just mentioned, as Ooh. well as these visions and dreams and very, very yeah, yeah. So let us show you from Scripture how Satan could deceive you. Ezekiel thirteen six. They have seen false visions and lying divinations. They say, declares the Lord, when the Lord has not sent them. Yeah, this passage in Ezekiel thirteen is a key one. We just pulled one verse out of here, but just from this verse alone. We know from Scripture there are such things as false visions and lying divinations that God is not behind. That's right. They are like jackals, the uh, context says. Okay. Um, they are, there are false spirits and prophets. Yep. First John 4, 1. Yep. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. There you have it. This is now New Testament times. This is 
probably somewhere around 80, 80 or 90 when John is writing this. Yeah, it's later. Yeah. So you're talking six, 50, 60 years after Christ has ascended. Mm-hmm. The, first, the first generation's passed. The church is well established. This is to us. Mm-hmm. And John says, test every spirit. There are many false prophets. Yeah. There's a... Uh there's a, a temptation tendency. I don't know quite the right word there is, but there's a when, when you talk about spiritual things, and you're a Christian, or you're not a Christian, and you talk about spiritual things, mm-hmm. um, it is it, it, it's this otherworldly sort of feeling to it mm-hmm. that at, at times there's a temptation to say that's more real mm-hmm. than this, mm-hmm. um, and there's a sense in which what we mean by saying heavenly, where the fullness of the presence of God dwells, that's more real in a sense, mm-hmm. and yet not because this is not fake. Yeah. Um, so it's not helpful to make unwarranted distinctions between body and spirit. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not helpful um, to sort of talk about spiritual things and be easily swayed or led by them and, and sort of gullibly uh, interested um, because it says, don't believe every spirit. Right. Test them. And how would you test them? <laughs> well, um, you you test. We're we're, hap- we're hoping people, as they listen to us, are testing the words we say. Absolutely. Why do we quote scripture all That's the right. time? That's right. They're testing the words we say, not just against scripture, perhaps also of their own experience. Sure. Uh, and there's some things where they can have their own experience line up with it, and they go, "Hey, I, I." I I'm feeling that's true. Uh, and then the opposite can happen. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure I'm feeling that's true. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what they have to do with those examples that is parallel to here is see the fruit, see how it works, um, observe the doctrine, uh, observe the conduct um, of people who are aligned with that way of thinking, which is also meant by spirit, mm-hmm. right? It's not just like this this amorphous no. Uh, cloud-like being, right? Right. It is. It's the truth of of a false doctrine, spirit, um, teaching. Yeah, because John himself says. So, how do you test? And he goes on to say, every spirit that says Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Oh, that's what you were headed. Well, no, yes, no, of course. No, no it's the next. It's you the made next. me think of that. I wasn't right. actually looking for that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but. John gives an example of it yes. where he says, if what they're teaching is true and right about Jesus in accordance with the word of God, boom, okay, we're fine. Then we'll go with it. Yeah. We have examples of Jesus saying that to the disciples. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the next verse here in first John four says, uh, verse two, by this, you know, the spirit of God, right? Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Right. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. Yeah. So when I've had, and I know you've had this many times, Scott, when someone will say to me, hey, I had this thought or God impressed this on my heart, or I felt like God was telling me this. What do you think? Every time without fail, I try to find a scripture that either affirms it or denies or denies it. Yeah. And I do that as a way, first of all, for myself to know whether what they're saying is accurate. And Mm -hmm. secondly, to teach them are you submitting what you are hearing mm-hmm. against the written, revealed truth of God? Yes. And let me just parenthetically quickly add this. There's this, sometimes there's this, you're not being spiritual or mm-hmm. Holy Spirit led. Mm-hmm. If you're constantly trying to weigh it against the written and scripturated word, hold on a second. Um, the written and scripturated word of God is clearer, mm-hmm. um, has a long history of being led by the Holy Spirit, Mm -hmm. of which we are saying is Mm -hmm. the authority that you're claiming that Mm -hmm. me being too focused on the inscripturated word has made come to pass as reliable authority. So there is a fundamental at some level difference between just spiritual truth and the inscripturated written word of God that contains that truth. That's right. Um, This is more testable. This is more proven, yeah. um, it has already been led by the Holy Spirit right. to be what we call the truth and authority of Yeah, Second Timothy one twenty one. It's all over the place. Yes. Yeah. So there is this sort of tendency sometimes to say, oh, you're just, you're just trying to quote a verse. And uh, 
Well, there's a good reason why. That's right. It's not just namby pamby willy nilly. Right. What did Jesus do? I, I think of Matthew 19 when they came to him to test him on divorce. Right. You know, have you not read? He said, have you not read? He goes right. immediately to scripture. Yeah. What about when Satan came to test him in the wilderness? Four times. He, he goes I mean, three to times he goes straight to Deuteronomy. He goes to scripture. Yeah. All of what he said is based on scripture. Uh, just, just that's our guide. And that's how we know if it's a false divination, vision, revelation, if it's a false spirit, a false prophet. And the reason is, and our next point here and why we're, this is dangerous. The reason is Satan is a counterfeiter. Mm. He has a little of the truth, but it is used for counterfeit or false reasons and purposes. This yes. is straight from Scripture. Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Think about those words. He disguises himself as an angel of light. Mm -hmm. How many people have said an angel appeared to me? I had a vision of God. I had a vision of heaven. God told me. And well, I just had a warm feeling or there was light involved or I saw an angel. I, I'm sorry, if that doesn't line up with scripture, that is Satan disguising himself to lead you astray because that's exactly what it says here. Yeah. And then Paul yes. makes an even stronger argument. Galatians 1, 8, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one that we preach to you, let him be accursed. If an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we have preached yes let him be damned accursed yes wow and some people say but even if we preach a gospel contrary to what we preached <laughs> meaning uh you know the question like oh, well paul says we we yes but he's saying the we that we preached before was the genuine gospel he's already um said this gospel to them that can be trusted that they themselves know and he'll make that argument throughout the rest of galatians right right so when he says we preached in the second one there he means contrary to the true gospel and when he gives what his gospel is in first corinthians 15 1 through 4 it's all according to the scriptures yes yes according to the old testament scriptures his new testament message yes if you hold fast to the word i preached to you yeah but he'll say that. He's, what does he say? I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Yep. Yes. Which is how we know that his death for our sins was the good news that follows there. Yeah. All right. So dreams, visions, and prophecies can be from Satan and used for evil because visions and divinations and revelations can be faked. There are false spirits and prophets. Satan is a counterfeiter and miracles may be done by Satan to deceive people. I think this is a, a helpful caveat. That's a, a little scary if <laughs> yes. you think about it. This is Revelation 13 speaks about this. Um, in a number of places, actually, yeah. in, in, in apocalyptic literature, talks about those used of the evil one, the beast, and the like to do this. I mean, this. if you even go back to Moses leading the people out of Egypt. I think that every time I come by those, yeah, those passages. His Pharaoh's magicians and sorcerers were able to replicate a few of the signs. Right, yeah. Revelation 13 says, it performs great signs. Who is it? It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that is allowed, that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Yeah, so this is the second beast. Yeah, there's multiple beasts in Lots Revelation, beasts. but they're all empowered by or representative of Satan himself. Mm -hmm. And fascinating here, they can call fire down from heaven. Mm -hmm. And they but what's the purpose? To deceive those who dwell on the earth to make an image for the beast. Mm -hmm. So D certainly don't buy into, well, it was a miracle. I, I saw a miracle. I witnessed a miracle. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. But that by itself doesn't tell you anything. Well, and to complicate it and make it a little scarier, um, some of what John may be doing in Revelation 13 isn't just talking about um, the beast and, and it does it in front of the people, right? It's allowed to work in the presence of of the people who dwell on earth, yeah. telling them to make an image for the beast, right? Yeah. Um, that's not just them out there. Hmm. Um, there's some implication here that John is looping in false apostles okay. that he refers to earlier in chapter two. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's not just them out there. Uh, miracles may be done by Satan to deceive people. Yeah. Now, not those who are ultimately gods who will be his forever. 
Mm-hmm. I'm not talking about them. But anybody who might think they're a them who isn't a them. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So this is all of scripture that points out where dreams, visions, prophecies, divinations can be false, fake, evil. But Scott mentioned this earlier. Why do we keep coming back to the written word of God? And, and you mentioned it's tested, it's true, it's tried, it can be counted on. Well, well, let's talk about the Scripture talks specifically in those terms about count on the Word of God mm-hmm. because it's in a totally different category. Yeah. This is uh, 1 Peter 1, um, grabbing from Isaiah 40. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the Word of the Lord remains forever. And this Word is the good news that was preached to you. Yeah, so the Word of God never fails. That's the point Peter makes here. Yes. And then Paul, uh, speaking to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.15, makes the point that the word of God contains the truth that leads to salvation through faith in Christ. Yeah. 2 Timothy 3.15. Yeah. From childhood, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Acquainted with the sacred writings. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, the word of God is, according to Scripture, inerrant, infallible, and authoritative. This mm-hmm. is uh, the next verse in Second Timothy three. This is verse sixteen. Mm-hmm. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. And then the word of God is not only these things we've been saying doesn't fail, contains the truth, inerrant, infallible, authoritative. It's complete. Yes. It's written and complete. Yes. Beloved, although this is Jude 3, Jude has one chapter, Jude 1, 3. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Yeah, that phrase has caught the attention of theologians through the years, once for all delivered. Mm -hmm. It has the implication of everything that we have is everything we need, and it's complete, and it's done, and it's been delivered. Here's the package. Right. Jude wrote this at a time where the faith had been a fixed thing. Yeah. Established in the apostolic teaching of the early church. That's right. Yeah. And if you think of the argument, well, if God would just reveal himself to someone, or maybe if I, I could just have a vision, but Jesus talked about this if issue. If he could just write it in the sky yeah, for me. Just show up and talk to me personally. But Jesus made this point. If people won't listen to the written word of God, they're not going to be convinced by visions, dreams, and miracles. Yes, I love this when Jesus says this. Uh, this is Luke sixteen thirty one. 31. Um, in fact, he says before this, even Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. Uh, and he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Sure. All I need is a miracle. Yeah. If someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And Jesus said, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will be the, they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. And then he demonstrated Which, that by rising from the dead. Not ironically. And <laughs> clearly he knew what he was saying. Right. Happened. Right. So... <laughs> Just to sum this up, I, I think that's a good scripture that points out if you have the written word of God, that's what you need. It's sufficient. Right. Are there cultures in which they do not have access to the written word of God? Yes. There are a few still left, absolutely. And there are lots of people going over and trying to do work. And right. We know some of those people who are doing that translation work with those people. Yeah. Is it possible in those cultures for God to reveal himself through a dream or a vision? I know of such stories. Of course it's possible. Yes. But he will never do so in contradiction to the written word of God. Correct. And they will always be led, if it's genuine, to Christ and to the word of God. That's right. So I I think it's important we state that. But the culture in which we live and you listening to us today are not in that category. (laughs) If you have access to hear or see us today, you have access to the written word of God. That is to where you must turn. You're pretty much doing it on the internet, most yeah, likely. If that's you're right. Watching, listening to us. So we talked about general revelation, special revelation. And uh, this next form of the word of God is as a person. Yeah. And here's where we turn from the general and special revelation and a word of caution that and to get to Grudem specifically, to chapter two mm-hmm. of his systematic theology. Forms yeah. of the word of so God. So we'll start this, and then we'll continue this in our next session. Yep. And we'll pretty much just cover the first one here. The word of God as a person, Jesus. Yeah. So the Bible, not always, but 
often refers to the Son of God as the Word of God. Yeah, very interesting. And yeah. you're about to start a, a session, I mean, a uh, series in John, which you'll get to this. Yeah. But the Grudem makes the point, in the Trinity, in the Godhead, in the three in one, it's God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, whose role yes. it is, most obviously, to communicate the character and the will of God. Yes. That's what he does. In flesh. If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Right. Yeah. Revelation 19, 13 says he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the word of God. The name by which he's called is the word of God. Yeah, that's powerful. It's his name. <laughs> it's Jesus' name, the word of God. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Um, it, this word, word in John 1 isn't confined to this, but John is grabbing... Uh, some Greek terminology and putting it in with this idea of who Jesus is mm -hmm. and saying the Greek sort of noose, the, the reason that is the underlying reality of all things, yeah. right? The, the, the people understood that, that term there. Uh, the noose, the logos, um, was that principle of reason. And he said, like, that truth is incorporated into this God, yeah. um, who he would say later is Jesus. Yeah. And we'll get there in the next verse here. Verse. Uh, yeah. How do we John know 1, he's 1, talking about Jesus? Because in verse 14 in John 1, he says, that word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Yeah. Yeah. I, if you think about this, being called the word of God has many implications. A couple of them are that he is the disclosure of what God intends to communicate to us. That's right. He teaches us who God is. If only he could show me and write in the sky. You yeah. mean like a person <laughs> yeah. who is speaking to you? Oh, but you're not Jesus, but I'm speaking to you. <laughs> and I'm saying the same truths yeah. um, of the gospel. Yeah. First John 1 John 1.1 says something similar. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Yeah, here he calls Jesus the word of life. And he goes on to talk about in him was life and that life was the light of men. And uh, he loves the term life. So he's the word of God. He's the word of life. Still speaking of Jesus. Yeah. Um, John 6, verse 63. This is Jesus now speaking. Yes. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life. So there's that communication from Jesus himself. My words are spirit and life. Like if you pay attention to what I'm saying, yeah. he will find in me through my words, life eternal and the spirit of God, which the flesh, as he distinguished from there, cannot do. That doesn't help you at all. Yeah. The human nature, emotions, will, intellect, all of that cannot produce what his words can yeah uh john 14 9 jesus said to him have i been with you so long and you still do not know me philip right he's like show us the father yes whoever has seen me has seen the father whoa how can you even say show us the father yeah and then of course this is the famous passage in which he says i'm the way the truth and the life but here his point is if you've seen me you've seen the father yeah. I am the disclosure of God. That's why I'm the word of God. Yes. A lot of folks will say, Jesus Jesus never claimed to be God. <laughs> uh, very explicitly, take just John. Yep, just John. Just John. He talks about that many times. Yeah. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In ways that apparently those around him understood as a claim to deity because they tried to stone him. Yeah, those who didn't like this idea tried to kill him because they understood exactly what he was saying. Yeah. That's right. So don't don't ever believe that lie. Well, Jesus never claimed to be God. His followers put those words in his mouth or no, no, no. Yeah. Here's an example. You've seen you've seen me? You've seen God. Yeah. Last verse here for today under this idea that the Bible refers to God as uh, to Jesus as the word of God is Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. We yep. read a few of these before. Yeah, but a good place to end. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, because Hebrews is going to focus on Jesus mm -hmm. from here on out, mm -hmm. <laughs> but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. Yeah, he's spoken to it. This is why he's the word of God. So 
Yes, the Bible definitely refers to Jesus as the Word of God. Many other things, yes. but the Word of God being one of those. And I love that Revelation 19, the name by which he is called is, is. the Word of God. Good stuff. Yeah. We will end there and pick up next time about uh, these forms of the Word of God. Yeah, yeah, we'll get into uh, God's decrees, when he personally addresses people, yep. using human speech, writing things down in Scripture. We'll, we'll talk about all that. Yeah, and there are many more of those sort of forms of the word mm -hmm. than people realize. Yeah. It's uh, helpful to, to work through those. Thanks for joining us. See you next time on bb and <laughs>